There were echoes of lockdown, but at least there were trains then. Today, many lines had none at all. Strange, it's strange, but I think, um, um, yeah, I think a lot of people were working from home. Very ghostly, isn't it? It's nice, yeah, it's nice though, peaceful. 50,000 rail workers went on strike, bringing large chunks of the network to a standstill. Boris Johnson upped the rhetoric, telling the Cabinet the whole rail industry could go bust if it doesn't make giant efficiency savings. We need, I'm afraid, everybody, and I say this to the, to the country as a whole, uh, we need to get ready to, to stay the course to stay the course, because these reforms, these improvements in the way we run our railways are in the interest of the travelling public. If we don't do this, these great, great companies, this great industry will face further financial pressure. It will go bust. The disruption of services is expected to continue into tomorrow before a second strike day on Thursday. Network Rail claimed talks on finding efficiencies that would help them up their current pay offer had made headway. We want to modernise maintenance, uh, get rid of working practices dating from the 60s and 70s, which will deliver hundreds of millions of pounds of savings for the company. And we could translate those savings then into a better deal on the table for the RMT. The RMT disputed how close agreement had been and said the government was tying the hands of rail management, preventing a deal. Companies are being dictated to by the Department for Transport and the Treasury to take a stance that is a provocation against our members. So as soon as they can back off from that, we can get a deal and get a settlement for this situation. Everybody's entitled to a, a slight right, you know, an increase in the salary, but I think to cut the, uh, the rail... You know, to cut the trains off completely is not acceptable. I do have sympathy, but, you know, I mean, it's, I mean they've got to do what they feel the need to do, but then you've got everybody else who um, suffers from the impact of that. I don't have any sympathy whatsoever. It's just inconvenience to everybody. Personally, I think they earn enough. Complete solidarity with the trade services, completely agree with it. And, yeah, I hope they get what they want, to be honest, yeah. The government's brace for more industrial action elsewhere in the public sector the speculation that below inflation pay awards could soon be announced for workers in schools, hospitals and councils, triggering potential strikes there. Royal Mail workers announced they'd be balloting on strike action. It's prompted talk that the country's returning to the late 1970s. But the scale of union membership and industrial action is of a completely different order now. For every 100 days that were lost due to strikes in 1979, only one was lost due to a strike in 2019. Now, I would imagine that number will be bigger in 2022, uh, but I cannot see it being anything like as, as large as it was in 1979. Big inconveniences, but not a sense of the country grinding to a halt. I, th I think that would be a very good way of summing, summing it up, absolutely. The Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, said he didn't want to see front benchers in his own party joining picket lines. But one of them joined nine backbench Labour MPs defying the leader at a Victoria Station picket line today. Four more frontbenchers joined other picket lines. It's very easy for Labour leaders to become frightened of the right-wing press and misjudge the mood in the country. And that's what you think is happening with Keir Starmer? This isn't the last strike that's going to be taking place. Because workers are being attacked, we're seeing the National Education Union talking about strike action, we're seeing talk of further strike action uh, in the public sector and elsewhere. Complicating Keir Starmer's life even more, the leader of Scottish Labour, Anna Sawa, joined a picket line in Edinburgh. After lockdown, many more chose to work from home rather than struggle into the office by road. Many main routes were said to be flowing freely. Talks between the rail union and management are due to resume tomorrow. Well, earlier I spoke to the government minister, Michelle Donnellan, and I began by asking her how it is that pensioners deserve a 10% rise in their income, yet public sector workers don't deserve anything like that. So we're not saying that public sector workers don't deserve 
a pay rise. What we're saying is that uh, we don't think that these strikes are appropriate. In fact, what we think is that irresponsible and dangerous. They are. I'm hearing stories of students with added pressure and stress trying to get to exams. I'm hearing uh, stories of, of people that are worried about how they're going to get to work when they know that they've got cost of living challenges. I, I'm hearing stories of people struggling to get to their, their doctor's appointment. These are not the right answer. And also, we know that if we just keep rising and rising and rising uh, we, 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 and we keep increasing wages, then we will actually fuel inflation and we'll make the problem worse for everybody. Yeah, but I, I asked you a but I asked you a different question. I asked you to, to tell me why it is that pensioners deserve a 10% rise in their income and public sector workers don't. We haven't actually uh, settled that at the moment. What we're not we're not saying that one sector or one group of people uh, deserves more than another in this debate. I think you're trying to detract from the main issue, and the main issue well, you've is that rail the triple strikers, lock, though, haven't you, which will see pensioners getting a 10% rise. Well, look, you know, pensioners, some of them are the most vulnerable in our society. I have always supported the triple lock as a constituency MP and a minister. But what I do condemn is these rail strikes. What is the government then prepared to do to try and thwart these strikes if they're causing as much damage as you say? Well, we've been very forthright on this subject. Unfortunately, the opposition haven't, who have emboldened these strikes. In fact, we've seen some shadow ministers out on those picket lines. They're not lines running the country, it. though. You're running the country. Tell us how you're going to stop these strikes, because you're in charge here. Well, we are in charge, but we're not in charge of these strikes. That's the unions. The unions are literally uh, gridlocking our country this week and intend to do that over the coming weeks. It's irresponsible. It's dangerous. They're using young people and others as a bargaining chip. Boris Johnson, during the party conference, made a high-wage economy a central pledge. He said it was a key way, the main metric, in fact, of measuring whether levelling up had worked. Has he abandoned that concept? No, absolutely not. And in my own uh, department, in my own area, um, our main mission is to upskill and reskill those people that need it to enable them to get those better paid jobs or to go on and, and get promoted within their sector. But what we're facing at the moment is an unprecedented time where we have a, a particular problem with uh, prices are going up, uh, partly because of the aftershock of the pandemic, partly because of what is happening in the Ukraine. You know, forecasts show it will be temporary, and we have to deal with that. What we don't want to do is exacerbate that further, uh, and that has uh, certainly been our key message. So when Boris Johnson said he was in favour of a high-wage economy, did he just mean the private sector? No, absolutely not. And we've, we've discussed this point al already. Um, the, uh, the point was that we need to reskill and upskill people to enable them to go after those, those jobs that they really want, those promotions and those better paid jobs. But we are facing a temporary period exacerbated by the pandemic and, uh, and of course, the war in Ukraine, which is pushing up costs, not just in this country, but across the globe. And we as a government need to be responsible in our approach when tackling that. Does the private sector need to be responsible as well and reduce their pay rises? Well, the Bank of England have already issued a statement on this, urging caution when it comes to uh, pay rises, because what we don't want to see is the further fueling of inflation. And the Prime official spokesman rebuked the Bank of England governor. So do you now support that call for caution? So what I'm saying is that we all need to be responsible and ensure that we're not further fueling inflation. You were talking about whether it should be in line with inflation across the board. I'm saying that we all have a responsibility to try and support people throughout this period. I don't think the government should be anything but proud of the fact that we are putting people at the heart of our policies and plans and trying to assist them the best we can through this. And we've announced a £37 billion package to do that. We're keeping everything under review you and we'll be continuing to support people. Michelle Donlan, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, Mick Lynch, who's General Secretary of the RMT Union, joins us now from outside London's Euston Station. Mick Lynch, I wondered if you'd like to take this opportunity to apologise unreservedly to people who might have missed hospital appointments or students who had a stress getting to their exams. Well, we are sorry for that. We don't want anyone to be inconvenienced. We want to run the railway system and the transport systems, maritime, the buses, in a way that serves the communities that our members live in. We're, we are ordinary men and women, working class people that are trying to make a living. 
along with everyone else in this society, but we're not getting a square deal. We hope to get a settlement to this dispute so we can get back to running the trains on behalf of the public, moving the people and the goods and the services around. But we need a square deal like everyone else. We don't want to lose our jobs. We don't want our terms and conditions ripped right. up. And we want a pay deal. We haven't had a pay deal for three years in many cases. OK, I'll come back to the outlines of that deal and how you might be prepared to compromise. But how long are you going to keep this up? We've got another couple of strikes coming. Are you going to have a summer of strife if you need to? Well, we've got a programme of action this week and we'll review that next week when that's taken. Our members have turned out solidly, absolutely rock-solid support for this action. They're very motivated to take these companies to task and get an agreement. If we can't create a solution, which we'll be talking about to both sets of companies tomorrow, we won't have an agreement, so therefore we will pursue more industrial action. That's the mandate that we've got. It's our lawful right to do that. We've met all of the threshold set down in the Tory anti-trade union laws. And we will pursue our agenda, and I think other workers in this country will be pursuing a similar agenda as the summer progresses. And we hopefully can synchronise that right. and coordinate so to with Christmas other and beyond, if working you need people to. and we can get a deal. Will the strikes do what, sorry? To Christmas and beyond, if you need to. Well, I haven't mentioned Christmas. That's not come out of our, our mouths. I don't know who's come up with that. But if, the, if there's no agreement, then it will be something attritional, won't it? But we need an agreement. We speak to the companies uh, as often as we can. We'll be meeting with them tomorrow. If they can come to their senses and the government can unleash uh, their negotiators so that they can uh, have a bit of liberty to make a deal, which I think we can do with them, then we can get an agreement very quickly okay. and get back to work. Right. Well, you keep on talking about a deal and an agreement, so how are you going to come to your senses? How are you going to move tomorrow in negotiations? Lay out for me one area that you might compromise on. Well, I haven't lost my senses at any stage, Cathy. I'm, I'm very grounded in what we need to do. So what we'll be doing is talking to the companies about a job security package. If we can secure a job security package so that our people can be guaranteed their jobs, we can then move on to talking about the changes that they want related to new technology and the flexibility the agenda they've got. But what we need to do while we're discussing that is to protect our conditions so that our members don't slide into a version of the gig economy, casual work and vulnerable employment. And when we resolve that issue, we can move well, on to what is a decent that pay deal in the past. so that, that addresses the cost of living Let crisis. OK, let me put to you what the employers say, because they say you're stuck in, stuck in the past, that you've got staff who refuse to share transport, that you're blocking this app to communicate with staff, that you're not turning on forward-facing cameras in your vans. I mean, are you fond of the 1980s? Would you like to go back there? No, I was I started working in the 1970s, Kathy, strangely enough. I've, I know I don't look it, but I'm not fond of the 80s or the 70s. I'm in the here and now, and I want to do an agreement for our members. This stuff that has been stoked out by the Tory party and repeated by every media outlet that we're somehow stuck in the mud is nonsense. We negotiate technolo technological changes with all of our employers all of the time, including Network Rail, where we are fully automated. Uh, inspection trains, we've got on-train technicians, we're using all the modern apps, we're booking onto jobs through uh, remote working, we're using GPS technology. So some of this is nonsense. What they don't like is that we've got some decent conditions that cost them a few bob to maintain. They want to strip them off us so that they can Will exploit you... us more than they're currently doing. OK, you remember the 1970s, you've said that. You saw off a Conservative Prime Minister then. Do you think you can do the same with this one? Well, it's not to, for me to set the government. The government is elected through the ballot box uh, and it will be up to the public who puts them out or maybe the Tory backbenchers will do that. Uh, so we're, I'll wait for the election. This is not an overtly political campaign. It's being made political by the Tory party and the, and the, the right-wing media in this country. We're running a straightforward industrial dispute that's about protecting jobs, uh, negotiating conditions and getting a pay deal for our members. We're not going to bring down the government. That's up okay, to the British you... public to do that through the ballot box. Did you cause as much disruption as you wanted today or did a lot of people work from home and get round it? Well, our members adhere to the call that they voted for. 89% of our members were in favour of this strike and a 72% turnout, I think. So we had picket lines up and running effectively from the north of Scotland down to the south coast and in England and uh, Wales as well. It's been as effective as it could be. 
We don't want them to have to do that, but we will take effective industrial action if we cannot get an agreement. And we will defend our members and we will defend our right to make agreements with companies rather than having stuff imposed on us and our lives made worse by government diktat. Right. Mick Lynch, thank you very much for joining us from London's Euston. Well, let's get the latest picture from our correspondents in Scotland and Wales. Kieran Jenkins is at Queen's Park Station in Glasgow and Andy Davies is in Cardiff. First now to Kieran. Well, as of half past six tonight, there were no trains going anywhere in Scotland. And in fact, for most of the day, the whole network has been kaput. Nine in ten domestic services were cancelled and services coming up from England uh, were drastically reduced. And as you saw a few minutes ago in Gary's piece, the Scottish Labour leader Anna Sawa, one of the most high profile Labour figures to defy high party command uh, and go out to a picket. And that's uh, telling, I think, because because he's not a hard liner. He's somebody who's followed uh, Keir Starmer right throughout this project. And in fact, there's been no distance between them really over anything, I think, up until uh, this point. We'll see disruption here over the course of the week in between the strike days. Today, much like rest of the UK, a lot of people stayed uh, at home. A lot of people took the bus, but that's not as simple as it sounds. First bus say they want to up the number of services, but they've got their own problems because there's a, a shortage of 450 bus drivers in Scotland they say because of Covid and because of Brexit. Now all this has been going on actually for some time in Scotland over a separate dispute. Scotrail drivers have been taking industrial action over a pay offer and one difference here is that Scotrail has recently been nationalised so the Scottish Government does have a stake in that dispute. Services have been severely disrupted but guess what? They did get a better pay offer and that's currently out uh, to a ballot of ASLEF members. That's the picture in Scotland. What's going on in Wales? Here's Andy Davis in Cardiff. Normally, this is the busiest station in Wales. There was a train which left for Bristol about an hour and a half ago. One has just arrived from Paddington. But that's it now. Nothing is going to be moving in and out of this station until tomorrow. And it marks the end of a day when there have just been 21 departures from this station. There's been an occasional bus replacement service, but that's also wound down for the day. And across Wales, it's been a picture of a very limited service. Nothing has been running west of Cardiff along these lines. Nothing running north of Merthyr Tydfil. So what you've had, in effect, is the whole of West Wales, Mid Wales and North Wales without um, a rail service today. Most of the trains are operated in Wales by the Welsh Labour government owned Transport for Wales, who are not in dispute with the RMT union and so have been able to run some services on Valley's lines where they control the signals. But the problem for them has been that most of the rail structure in Wales is managed by Network Rail, with whom the RMT union are in dispute. So it's really hamstrung the whole operation here. It's been keenly felt. Um, Admiral, one of the biggest employers in South Wales, has been encouraging its 7,000 or so staff to work from home today, and it sparked some really lively exchanges in the Welsh Parliament. It, I think it is worth adding as a footnote, though, that Wales has a smaller proportion of commuters who use the train as opposed to the car than in uh, compared with other parts of Britain. So in that sense, there has perhaps been less commuter dis uh, disruption witnessed here than elsewhere. Andy in Cardiff, Kieran in Glasgow, thanks very much to both of you. Let's go to Labour's Shadow Attorney General, Emily Thornbury. She joins us now from Westminster. Wonderful to have you back on the programme. I haven't seen much of Sir Keir Starmer today. Tell me, has he gone into a witness protection programme? <laughs> what are you talking about? We were in uh, Shadow Cabinet today. And, uh, but and I haven't seen much of him. The public hasn't well, seen much sorry, of him. I'm sorry, you haven't had a chance to the see him. The public hasn't I, I, seen I, him. He's not in witness protection. He was at Shadow Cabinet this morning and, uh, and we had a, a meeting for a couple of hours. Because he can't be on the fence and on the picket lines at the same time. So where exactly is he on this issue? Where we are is this is that we are a government in waiting. And just like as in government, we wouldn't be on picket lines, we're not going to be on picket lines now. Of course, we fully accept that the that uh, trade unionists have the right to withdraw their labor and the right to go on strike. But just as Mick has said from the, from the RMT, you know, he wants a deal. We need to get a deal. We need to get an agreement. And that's what we've been pressing the government to do, is to stop pouring, you know, 
sort of petrol on the flames of this and actually get involved but, and 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 find a solution. Right, I but mean, getting the, involved also means that the public knows where you stand. So when Keir, well, Starmer, yes. when Keir Starmer launched his leadership campaign in 2020, at the very front of the video that he put out was his description of himself as a proud trade unionist. And he, you know, he fondly remembered being a legal observer on the picket lines at Wapping. What's happened to that, Keir Starmer? Well, listen, he's a trade unionist. I'm a trade unionist. I say we're proud to be members of the Labour Party. It, the clue's in the name. It's the Labour Party. But when it comes to this dispute, as with all disputes, we accept that when there is a strike, it is a failure. It's a failure of negotiations. And in the end, there has to be an agreement. So what we should be doing is be making sure that parties get around the table and negotiate. But the problem is, is that in this particular dispute, we have... We have a kind of, you know, the spectacle of a ghost at the feast. You know, the the, peop the, the, the organisation pulling the strings is the government in this, and and they are not prepared but, to be involved at all. There isn't even a negotiating the, mandate of the, the rail organisations that are negotiating with the rail but unions. Both the strikers and the commuters who can't get their trains, or the students, or the doctors, or the nurses, want to know which side are you on. So which no. side are you on? No, no, no. What the what the what the commuters, the students, the nurses, the people who need to get on trains that work want to know is how is this going to be solved? This, they want to know how people are going to get together and how it is that that those using the railways are going to mm. be able to use the railways again. Right. And responsible, serious Grown-up politicians are interested in that rather than shouting from one side to another. You know, what a proper government would be doing, what we would be doing, is we would be involved in the negotiations in order to bring the sides together and also, frankly, to stand back and have a look, strategic look at our railways uh, post-pandemic. Okay. What do we expect to be happening to our railways and make sure that there is a proper steer? Very important discussion. But at the same time, Keir Starmer has said that he doesn't want anyone from the front page from, from the front bench to be on the picket lines. Four junior members of your front bench have appeared on the picket lines today, have tweeted about it, have put, posted pictures of it on social media. When are these people going to be disciplined by your leader? Oh, I don't, I don't know about that. I mean, presumably it's... Uh, uh, it'll but why be doesn't he discipline them? He puts out an order, you can't know. appear on the, mean, front, I... on the picket lines. And then what would you say to him? What would you do? Is... I would be leaving it to the shadow secretaries of state and to the and to the whip to sort so this out. One of the it whips turned up on the picket line. <laughs> one of the whips actually turned up on the picket line. Come on, Emily Thornbury. I don't know. You want to be I mean, attorney I general? Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know here. about this. I don't know do? who's done what. I don't know. I can't. I can't but tell you. But what would you do? What would your advice be? It's not my job. You know, it would be it would be a matter for their for their boss, their immediate boss, and the whips. Presumably whip, more senior whip than the, the whip on, on the picket line. Um, you can't whip the whips. sort out. I don't know. But it's a no, shambles, isn't it? Come on, it's you've not got a sh because oh, people, on. But people don't really know where you stand on this, and that is the problem. You're too busy putting on body armour to park your tanks on Tory lawns. That's your problem. No. What your problem is, is that you are being sucked into this idea that somehow or other it's about taking sides, it's about, you know, it's about one side versus another, and you are listening to... It's an industrial to, it, this dispute in no, which you have to take a stand as the no, opposition No, also, it's also a situation which is being wound up by mm. the likes of Linton Crosby, who has breakfast with the Prime Minister oh, every morning sake. and who's treating this as a wedge issue. You okay. say, for goodness sake, remember what they did in Australia in February of this this year, when Linton Crosby was advising that government, and they spent their entire time yeah. trying to use the rail dispute as a way of getting at the Labour Party. Right. We are not be getting involved in this All in right. such a ridiculous fashion. What we're saying is that we need to make sure that everyone gets around the table, that, they, that they sort this okay. problem out, and that we look after the commuters, All the right. workers who are trying to get to work. Got to leave it there. Emily Thornbury, thank you very much indeed.